Corey, uh, co-chair of the of the infrastructure interest group, um, and I think we're going to get started here in just a few moments. I'm looking at the list of participants. I'm just wondering if um, either Nicole or uh, Nicole, you're on the line. Is that right? Yes, I am. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Yes, I'm <laughs> okay. on the line. That's great. And I, okay. see that I see that Karen is also uh, on the line. So uh, thanks to both of you for being willing to facilitate the session today. Um, we're going to have uh, Kara Van Malsen from AVP and Heather Greer Klein from Duraspace talking about uh, costing storage and migration. And then uh, if there's time left over, we have a number of other agenda items, one around uh, possible member liaison position. Uh, and if Paige Walker, uh, sorry, Paige Walker, if she is on the call, I'm just looking through the, um, we may be able to hear from her uh, later on in the call. And then uh, if there's time left over, we'll talk about uh, planning for uh, 2019. Uh, and if we don't get that far today, that's okay. What I'll do is I'll send uh, some follow-up emails uh, so that we can start to pin down some uh, some topics and some facilitators for each of those topics so that we do have things ready to go uh, in the new year. So um, thank you everyone for joining us and I'll do my best to keep notes as we, as we um, move along here today. If you are in attendance, please do uh, add your name to the uh, to the minutes document and just let me know. I'm just going to actually copy and paste that link into the chat here for folks that might not be um, might not be in that document now. Uh, and without further ado, I, I'll turn it over to Nicole and Karen to facilitate our costing storage and migration session. Uh, great. This is Karen. Um, Nicole, um, do we do we had we decided who was going to go first? Um, I sorry. I am. I believe it was Heather, but I'm not sure. Um, I'm sorry. I'm away from my computer. I'm heading back to my home office right now. Um, if one of them is on the call, maybe they Oops. could. I know one of them emailed me that they preferred to go first. Which I see, I see Kara. This is Kara, um, and I did not email you to go first. So Heather, if you're here and you want to go first, that's fine. Um, yeah, this is Heather. I also didn't email about going first. Oh, I okay. I swear, I thought one of the exchanges, someone said they, they wouldn't mind just uh, speaking quickly and then being done. Okay. All right. My apologies. So whoever wants to go first, I have no preference. <laughs> Flip a coin. <laughs> <laughs> All right, how's this? Uh, Heather, go first. <laughs> sure, absolutely. I'm okay, happy. sounds good. <laughs> um, I do have some slides to give me just one moment here and I'll share my screen with folks. That looks great. I can see that really well. All right, excellent. All right, hi everyone. Um, I'm Heather Gerklein. I'm the services coordinator at Duraspace. Um, and my colleague, Bill Brennan, was asked to discuss the actual costs of retrieving content uh, from Amazon's AWS services, um, which is the cloud storage vendor that we use for our Dura cloud service, and particularly how to consider all of the costs that go beyond just storage when looking at a cloud service provider. So I'm going to review how DuraCloud handles um, staging costs for content that will be transitioned. I'm happy to answer any questions, but I'll note here at the top that I am filling in for Bill Brennan. Uh, Bill is our AWS and technical infrastructure expert, so there's likely questions I can't answer that he would be happy to answer. So I'm happy to bring questions back to Bill um, and to follow up with answers both in the notes and with folks directly. So quick overview, um, I'll just give a really quick overview of DuraCloud just to give you some context for how, how we look at um, AWS costs and, and the costs for things like staging and, and why we look at those things. Um, I'm going to quickly review 
AWS cloud storage options, and then I'm going to really dig into the costs for these options, um, how to approach staging for ingest, and then just some things to keep in mind when you're evaluating cloud storage options wow, when it comes to preservation storage. So a quick overview of DuraCloud. So DuraCloud is designed as a simple tool to move content from local storage to cloud storage providers, either AWS cloud storage providers or international academic preservation networks like Chronopolis. Uh, it adds on lightweight features that ensure data integrity. Uh, we can store any type of file, offers an option for automatic duplication of content to a secondary storage system, and uh, allows for, which allows for creating two cloud-based preservation items in one process. So all of these features and processes, these are all utilizing AWS S3 processes. So these all take advantage of that infrastructure and there's a cost associated uh, with all of those processes that go well beyond the cost of simple storage. Uh, DuraCloud's open source. It's currently offered as a service from DuraSpace, but also the Texas Digital Library uh, from ForScience in Europe, and it's currently under development as an offering in Canada. So our services technical director and the rest of our services team, we spend a lot of time uh, looking at optimizing our use of Amazon S3 in particular, and working to ensure that our annual subscription prices stay low, but also account for these variable monthly costs that we incur uh, from moving data in and out of storage, from making requests and calls to data and replicating it to other storage locations. Uh, this slide shows a little bit of a spreadsheet that we used uh, earlier this year when we were trying to look at some of our AWS costs and trying just to get an average compute cost for one terabyte of data stored in S3 and uh, replicated to Glacier for an average customer. Um, storage costs are really easy to determine, but all these other variable costs are not. And while with DuraCloud, we have a lot of costs that you wouldn't have if, <clears throat> excuse me, if your institution was looking just at, at directly contracting for cloud storage, um, a lot of those costs would be the same. That's what I'm going to dig into next. This is a quick overview of the AWS storage options. Uh, there's S3 standard, S3 infrequent access, and Amazon Glacier. These are the, the major options. Um, there's a continuum of frequency of access for these, and they're priced accordingly. So all of our DuraCloud accounts include S3 storage. It's, it's the primary, um, it's, it's the workhorse storage option. Uh, and it's also where the bulk of pricing complexity occurs. So in terms of export costs, which is what I believe Bill was asked to speak about for S3 and Glacier, it's important to keep in mind there are three components of pricing to consider. So there's storage pricing, there's request pricing and there's data transfer pricing. So I have several slides that include this pricing, but you can review all of these costs um, at that URL there. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about each of these components. So looking first at storage, at the easy part. Um, it's not the full story of the cost, but as you can see, S3 standard storage is the most expensive. Uh, but it is the least, the most expensive for storage, but it's the least expensive for retrieval. And Glacier is the opposite. And S3 in frequent access just sits somewhere in the middle between those two. So here I've created an extremely simplified example of what this would look like for a terabyte of content stored for a month in each of these storage tiers uh, if they were fully retrieved once. I find this a little bit easier to look at than you know, percentages of, of a cent for a gigabyte of storage. So as I said, storage is the easiest component for pricing and things get much more difficult when we look at request and data transfer. So request pricing is the hardest to predict and it is the most often ignored, but it can make a significant difference in your month to month costs. So requests in S3 are used when content is to be moved into or out of storage. So for example, a get request is a request to S3 saying, hey, I need you to send me this file. Each and every one of these requests or calls to S3 is tracked 
and each and every one is charged. So a major component here is also something called life cycle transition, which means moving content between one tier or another based on criteria that you determine. Um, so by default, all content is stored in S3 standard, but it could be transitioned to other tiers based on policies you set. Like if data is begins to be accessed less frequently, it could automatically be moved over uh, to a cheaper storage option like infrequent access. So this can be extremely useful, but there's also a cost every time one of these transitions happens. Uh, data requests and retrieval from tiers other than standard are also incur fees. So retrieving data in the infrequent access tier costs about a cent per gigabyte as a data retrieval free fee. But note that this is just the fee to move it from infrequent access to standard. You haven't actually retrieved the content yet. Uh, you don't pay for that actual what we would think of as a download until you pay for the data transfer. So it's two separate fees. So this means if you use infrequent access S3, then you need to remember to account for data transfer as well. And here is that S3 standard data transfer pricing. Um, moving data into AWS is free. Moving data out of AWS is expensive. So you do get a small price break per gigabyte as you transfer more data out, but that doesn't kick in until you're retrieving more than 10 terabytes in a month. So most often you're looking at nine cents a gigabyte or about $90 per terabyte for all content retrieved. So that might not sound like very much, but it adds up really quickly if you need to get, especially if you need to get all of your content out at once. So this can also be a factor if you don't have much control over how much content is retrieved. So for example, if the content can be pulled directly by anyone through a repository. And in the Glacier tier, this cost depends on how fast you want the data to come back to you. So there's three options. There's bulk, there's standard, which is four times the cost of bulk, and there's expedited, which is three times the cost of standard. And just as I noted earlier, there's also fees for each request to perform a lifecycle transition. So for example, if content needed to move from infrequent access into Glacier or out of Glacier and into infrequent access. And finally, I was asked to touch on um, costs for staging content for ingest. So in the DuraCloud context for us, staging is used for content that's going to be prepared for ingest into the Chronopolis network. Uh, the Chronopolis Network is a track certified geographically distributed dark archive, and it's our most economical Dirt Cloud subscription uh, because content in Chronopolis doesn't incur all these variable charges that I've been going over. There's a set one time fee for content ingest, and then there's a set ongoing fee for storage. Um, so because the checksums performed within the closed Chronopolis system. So there's not the charge for pulling content out to do a checksum and then putting it back in. So it's much more predictable. Um, so when folks need to move their content into Chronopolis, we stage it in DuraCloud. And during the staging process, it's in S3 storage. So we account for this content uh, by, by limiting the amount of time it can be there. So we assume uh, no more than three months in this staging place. Uh, if it was more than that, um, it's possible that it would go through multiple checksums that would be unnecessary and would really increase our costs. So limiting the amount of time um, and accounting for exactly how much the data transfer will be and when it will happen, uh, we've been really successful at a limiting staging time. We've just been really successful at, at making those costs predictable by doing that. So um, I, I don't know, because we do all of our, um, all of our work in DuraCloud in cloud storage, I don't know much about um, if you have a different context, but, but using S3, it, we've, we've found a way to make it predictable just by limiting the amount of time. I just wanted to, to end my time here with some things to remember when you're looking at cloud storage providers, specifically for preservation storage. So 
When transferring content to storage, verify that the content is the same before transfer and after it lands in cloud storage. This requires generating checksums prior to transfer and comparing those values when, with what the providers provide back. Um, this is not always consistent between cloud providers. Uh, when content's in storage, ensure that that content is not changed or lost. Uh, this requires an automated process for pulling out content, performing a checksum calculation, and verifying that the original checksum matches that new checksum. So this should be done within the cloud where the content is stored to keep from having to pay those fees, those data transfer fees, to pull the, to pull the content out of the cloud network because those fees really add up and it can become substantial. You'll also want to keep track of all the content that's been placed into storage. So you won't know if a file is lost if you don't keep track of where it's stored. You'll want to maintain an audit trail for every item so you know where it was stored, when it was updated, and when it was deleted. And also manage multiple copies of files across multiple providers so that you can ensure you have redundancy. That is just a, a quick and dirty overview. These are things that we think about a lot with DuraCloud. I've got some further reading there, some good breakdowns of how to think about costs for Amazon Web Services and some more information about uh, DuraCloud and Cropolis Network. And I'm happy to answer questions here or take some questions back to Bill if needed. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Uh, yeah, this is Tony Polikil from the Columbia University Libraries. I'm here with a couple of members from my team. Uh, this was actually a very timely presentation for us. We're planning a transition of our preservation storage infrastructure, currently running entirely on-prem, into AWS native. Uh, we've been partners with Jira Cloud for a little while, where we have a few deviations from uh, some other providers in that we have Direct Connect and some other university participation involved that changes our billing structure. Um, but one of the interesting things that came out of the most recent reInvent uh, conference for us was the announcement of S3 Intelligent Tiering and the Glacier Deep Archives. Um, S3 Intelligent Tiering, for those that don't know, does some machine learning based automatic transitioning of content from S3 to S3 and frequent access. And Glacier Deep Archive is an even cheaper version of Glacier. Uh, my question for, for the presenter was that with the introduction of services like these or new storage classes, does that, has that already affected or come into consideration for changing your pricing structure? Yeah, that's a great question. So Bill goes to the, the reInvent conference every year and did come back with a whole laundry list of things that we want to investigate, um, op potential options. Um, and I think in intelligent tiering, I'm sure, is one, although it doesn't ring a bell to me, but I know we talked about Glacier Deep Archives. So we are always looking at um, what's, you know, what, what would meet a need. And um, I, I definitely think anything that, anything that can help make these costs less variable and, and anything that could help um, with specific use cases that, that we're always looking at and controlling costs as, as folks get more and more content into storage we're looking. So that is definitely something that we're, that we're evaluating. And I think um, it's always a great idea if you can to keep an eye on, on the new things that come out. I know it, it can be a bit overwhelming. It seems like every reInvent bill comes back with a lot of new ideas, um, which is great, but there, there's a lot of um, R&D we have to find time and, and funds to do when we, when we wanna make a change like that. Are there any other questions? Um, you can also type the question in the chat if you'd like. I wanted to just really quickly mention, this is Corey from uh, Copal in Western Canada, that we um, recently received some federal funding to um, build uh, some DuraCloud infrastructure in Canada right, that's sort of decoupled from Amazon Web Services. Uh, although something like Glacier could be a storage endpoint, we plan to um, uh, see if we can run this at the University of Toronto Data Center. So 
I'm just trying to abstract it to public infrastructure and just wanted to let people know that that project is uh, underway right now. And if anyone does have any specific questions around that, I can direct them to the technical people at Toronto that would be able to answer your questions. Okay. Um, um, any other questions? Going once. Going twice. Shall we move on to Kara? Uh, sounds good to me. Thank you so much, um, Heather. That was a great presentation. Um, so next up, we have Kara Van Nelson. She's partner and senior consultant at AVP. Um, and she's going to be introducing uh, cloud storage and vendor profiles information. So take it away, Kara. Thank you. Thanks. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, let me just get my screen sharing going here. Just one sec. Oh, that looks like notes, doesn't it? Uh -huh. OK. Can you guys see my screen OK? Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Okay. That's good. Thank you. Okay, so um, hi, I'm Kara Van Malsen from AVP. And um, if you're not familiar with us, um, you may know us by our former name, which was AV Preserve, which we've changed. So now we're AVP. Um, we've just shortened it a little bit. So I'm here today to talk about a resource that we developed a few years ago called Cloud Storage Vendor Profiles. It's a little bit broader than um, focusing on costs, but, um, but maybe, maybe it fits into the, today's theme. It, it does touch on that topic, so I hope it'll be relevant. Um, so I'm gonna give you an overview, and I have to apologize in advance. When we were asked to give this talk a few months back, we had actually been planning to update this resource and have it updated by the time we would be presenting here today. And that has not happened woefully. So we've just gotten very busy this year and we haven't had a chance to update it, but maybe this is a good opportunity for me to get some input from you all and see if you have suggestions for us. So I'll just give you um, some background information, explain what the cloud storage vendor profiles are um, and what, their, what the goal is and um, tell you about what we're considering for updates in 2019. Um, I'm, I'm not going to show slides. I'm just going to walk through our website so that it's very easy for you to just see where these things live and um, you can access them yourself. So if you go to our website, we are avp.com. Um, this is our homepage. And um, if you're not familiar with us, we are a consulting and software development firm and we focus on all aspects of information management. So preservation is um, one of our areas of expertise. And of course, we have a lot of clients who over the years have been increasingly interested in cloud storage. So a few years back in 2014, we, you know, people were really starting to wonder about cloud storage. Should I be using it? What should I think about? How should I consider, in, you know, in integrating it into my preservation environment? So we, um, uh, you know, with those kind of requests and those topics coming up at conferences and in discussions, we thought, well, why don't we put something together that makes it easy at a glance for people to see some basic information about cloud storage providers from a preservation perspective. Um, so just showing you where this thing lives, it's uh, under our resources page right here. Um, and then if you scroll or you can click this section, papers and publications will take you to it. So um that would bring you here and you'll find a few different resources on this page so there's a couple of there's a few documents one of them is a is a more narrative document called nine things to consider when assessing cloud storage then there's some keys to reading the profiles which are these and i'll go over that in a second and then there's um we use the ndsa levels of preservation um as one of our um one of the tools that we use in the evaluation and um, uh, kind of this is like a summary view of some of those comparisons. So you can see that this is a little out of date. 
Um, we, the latest updates are here. So the last ones we did were in 2017, we added the Oracle, um, two different uh, service offerings from Oracle, but the others have been, been um, not been updated in several years. So we are very aware of this and we know that they really need to be updated. Um, and that is our goal. And that's what we had planned to show you today. So sadly, not the case. But, um, and I don't even know if uh, this one exists anymore. It might not. Um, anyway, so, um, but I'll just kind of still give you a bit of an overview. All right, so this document, nine things to consider when assessing cloud storage, um, you can find it in both English and Spanish. So share it with your Spanish speaking colleagues. Um, is this is this right here? Again, this, this was written in 2014 um, by our then consultant, Seth Anderson, who, you may now know is at Yale University, so he's no longer with us, but he is the one that wrote this. Um, and so what it does is it goes into thinking about or how to think about cloud storage as a component of your digital preservation repository um, or just your digital preservation environment and it being one piece of a larger picture um, that, that includes technologies, people, processes, and policies. Um, so we are treating the, the assessment of cloud storage just like any other type of technology you would need to assess, um, which you, know, you have a set of criteria that you would use to evaluate it, starting with your own requirements for that technology. So what are your use cases? Um, you know, what are your constraints? What are your functional requirements? What are your technical preferences? All those kinds of things. Um, and then it goes into, um, several different aspects that these become the criteria that you'll see in the cloud storage profiles in just a second. So um, how is the hardware managed, the data management, so that goes into things like related to fixity, um, reporting back, how are errors, report fixity checks, et cetera, reported, um, other metadata created by the provider, um, and those types of reporting mechanisms things about performance and the speed for retrieval and input and those kind of aspects that Heather was just touching on. Um, security, any um, very particular kind of security requirements that you might have to consider. Um, what about encryption? What about encryption at rest? What about encryption in, via in transfer? Um, who's responsible for man maintaining and managing encryption keys? These kind of questions, disaster recovery. Um, and what, what is the end of life for the service look like. Um, so, so that's kind of a quick and dirty um, summary of this document. It's not too long, but I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on it right now. Um, so back to this page, this one. So the next thing that we have is the key to reading the profiles and, nope, not that one. Nope, not that one, this one. Okay, um, which this is just like, Here's what we're gonna cover for each of the vendors that, that we evaluate. These are the criteria that we look at. So the, there's some you know, basic information here um, that is explained at this, at this section. And so the costing piece, I'll just highlight because that's the topic today. We don't really go into detail here because these pricing, the pricing is changing constantly for these vendors. Um, so it doesn't make sense to kind of capture that and say like, here's the price, you know, you can refer back to their site and a lot of them have calculators that you can use to calculate storage costs as, um, as we just heard it, that part is kind of relatively the easy piece. Um, but we're categorizing costs according to like a low, medium and high tiering um, way of thinking about your overall costs for um, these the service provider. And this is the, um, the cost ranges that we're using for each of those tiers for that categorization. In our updates, this might change. Costs of storage have changed in the last four years, so this might not be the same set of thresholds that we use in the future, but just so you know, that's how we've approached it. Um, and then these categories that I briefly showed you on that other document are the ones that we look at. So if you look at an example um, storage provider profile, so this is specific to Amazon Glacier, we separate out the storage uh, services, at least that's what we did initially. So there's, a, there's an S3 profile and then a Glacier profile, and those are two separate um, 
documents. Will we do that in our update? I don't know. So to be determined, we have to figure that out. Um, but there are specific things that are that are relevant to each one. Um, so you know how redundancy is performed is different in Glacier than it is in S3. Um, how reporting is done. All of these things are are different in each of these types of services, even from the same service provider. Um, so we keep it short. They're all like two pages long. Um, we tell you, you know, what what com uh, standards they have compliance with. Um, you know, what kind of service offerings, the cost tiering, as I was mentioning, um, whether their infrastructure is wholly owned or if it's sort of leased or shared from another provider. Um, and then here is how we're looking at the levels of preservation. So we have a quick and easy to absorb at a glance um, highlighting scheme. So if it's green, they comply. If it's yellow, they comply with part of it. So you can see the, um, the bolding, I think, is the one that they don't comply with. I would need to double check that that's true, but I believe that's what it is. Um, and then in the non-compliance is highlighted in pink or red. So um, we're just looking at the, the aspects from the levels that are relevant to storage. So storage, data, integrity, and security. So they're, they're, we don't look at all aspects of the levels of preservation. So since we have several of these, um, these evaluations already done, we have this aggregation of the levels of preservation. Um, assessments here so you can kind of see at a glance like hmm Deternity is not doing so good in these categories what's going on there so rack space is sort of not scoring that well but you can see who's kind of doing well and who's not doing so well at a glance um, so that's that's basically what we have to offer here um, so we have the document that I showed you the the keys to reading the profiles the profiles themselves and then that quick uh, at a glance color highlighting profile comparison. Um, I just wanna point out that, um, let's see, how do we actually go about getting this information? So we do two, two things. So first we try to find as much information as we can on the public, publicly available websites of these companies. So you know, just aggregating that information, making it easy to read and consume um, for for folks that are interested in just some quick information. Um, but we also do work with um, these providers to ask them specific questions to try to get more detail from them. So we've built good relationships with many of these companies and um, have had good participation from them in the past. So, um, you know, we try to fill out as much as we can, but also get their input as well and get us to sh get them to show us documentation backing up any um, claim they might make to how they provide a certain or how they meet a certain set of criteria that we're asking about. Um, what else should I mention? Okay, so for 2019, um, you'll probably you'll probably look at this list and think, gee, you're missing a big one, um, which is true. We're missing Microsoft Azure. They're more of a new player on the scene, if you think about it. They weren't really in the cloud storage game in 2014, but they sure are now. Um, Wasabi is another one we're going to be adding um, in the near future. And then um, Iron Cloud we'll put in here. And then we're going to update the ones that we already have and maybe take out any that we that don't exist. And then the question that we have um, to ourselves, and I guess I'd like to know from you all what you think. Um, we are considering removing or not including um, services that are not more or less just storage, just pure storage. So there, you know, one one way we're thinking about that is do do we not include com organizations or companies that don't wholly own their infrastructure, um, which would eliminate DuraCloud, which I don't think is the right thing to do because DuraCloud is primarily a storage service provider. So I think keeping like DuraCloud in makes sense, but something like Preservica, because it's more of an application for managing digital preservation that sits on top of somebody else's storage, I think would probably be out. So that's just how we're thinking about scoping this in the future. 
Um, it's really about storage. It's not about digital preservation systems in a comprehensive way. It's just focusing on this one piece and how do you think about using commodity storage services that are out there as part of your digital preservation infrastructure. Um, if we were to be evaluating entire digital preservation systems, we would do that in a slightly different way. So that's not what we're doing here. Um, so be, I guess my question to you guys would be, anybody else, any other companies that we're missing here that you think should be included? Um, and what would you think the right scope would be for, um, for what kind of services would be included and what wouldn't be? Um, and that is pretty much all I have today. And I'm happy to take any questions or thoughts that you have. Thank you, Kara. Thank you very much. Um, anybody have any questions or suggestions about um, some cloud providers that they might want to add to their list? Hi, this is Michelle at Cornell. Um, thanks, Kara, for um, uh, your overview there of the profiles and how to read that tool. That's very helpful. Um, one of the things that I always want to include when I evaluate storage is, um, as you've sort of alluded to, sometimes people resell or sometimes services are resold in new packaging. Um, for instance, to our cloud relying on Amazon. One of the things that I've always um, been concerned about is when you think you're being diverse in selecting different storage uh, for, for uh, your application, when in fact you may not be as diverse as you think you are because you may just be purchasing Amazon yet again under another hood. So I'm wondering if you're, if you're thinking about maybe teasing some of that out a little bit. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think so for, for the ones that are leasing, and I don't want to pick on DoorCloud, you guys are great. <laughs> but, um, but it, Nor it do does, I. I don't mean to pick on direct cloud. No. <laughs> um, we, we do highlight this. So it is saying like this is leased or contracted or, you know, and it says, and, whoops, yep, hello. Um, we're using, this is, you know, it's saying, and this was at the time you guys were doing this. So S3 Glacier and um, what's now Chronopolis. So uh, I think we try to put that front and center. So if you're working with a, with a vendor like this, here's where your storage is actually being leased from and just making it clear that that is um, a contracted set of services. So we try to highlight that for sure. Great, any um, chance that that information could just make the box in a really succinct way? Like I, not contracted, but actually describe, you know, just in a word who it's contracted from? Yeah, that's a good point. I think we could definitely do that for sure make that super clear in front and center. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, this is Corey. I'd just like to, to, to make a comment in terms of um, the profiles. And I'm wondering if you've put any thought into, I know that you're sort of thinking about how we can disambiguate sort of storage only services versus those with, that are doing a lot of other things. Um, I guess one of my concerns would be that, you know, we get a rating from Glacier where the cost is low, and then we have something like Chronopolis where the cost is high according to the profiles without um, necessarily um, being, being able to sort of quickly articulate the value proposition behind the different kinds of services. I'm, I'm not sure if you've had any experiences or thoughts uh, around that in terms of how to differentiate just sort of storage only services, commercial services versus other types of things? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, I think our attempt, our initial attempt at that was to do this. And so, and then when you go into the individual profiles, you get the detail and to be able to see that, okay, this might be really inexpensive, but you're lacking, you know, they're not adhering to these kind of criteria. Um, in, in terms of value proposition, or these might be costly, but you know they really do a great job of um, X, Y, and Z. So that's that's one way. But um, I think 
I'm just trying to look at one of them. What we try to do is, is highlight in an overview, like in the overview section, um, what is, what is this one really good for? Like, what is their kind of primary offering? Like what, what are the use cases that you would most see, um, this service being used for? So I guess those are a couple of ways that we try to do that now, but, and, and we do, you know, highlight anything that is, um, particularly interesting, you know, that, that you might want to note, um, like that this fixity checking is not available to clients, um, at least it wasn't at the time. So, but I think that there's probably more we can do in thinking about the, the cost component, like we were just hearing about, um, you know, those kind of retrieval costs that are, that are hard to quantify, um, maybe putting up some kind of, um, not calculator, but just like a sample data set and just looking at, costs associated with certain activities. So with the storage, with the transfer, with moving the things between tiers, um, you know, stuff, something like that. But, but then we would again, get really focused in on like Amazon or Microsoft or, um, and that, I could see that getting complex really quickly. Anyway, um, I'm just thinking out loud, but if you, if you have any suggestions, I'd definitely be open. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's good. Thanks. Hey, Kara, I, this is Karen. I've always wondered, um, you know, with audiovisual files, they're big files. So yes, granted, they're more terabytes, but does the, the construction of the file, I don't even know if construction is the right word, but the format of the file and what the file is make any kind of a difference in terms of how long it takes to upload or download? Oh, yeah, absolutely. But you know, part of that is, is depending on your bandwidth in and out of your building, you know? So it's hard to say where bottlenecks could be coming from, but they could be coming from any number of places. Um, I don't know. And maybe, maybe Heather would be the best person to ask if it takes more time to retrieve a really large video file from Glacier to S3. Um, does that take longer than a PNG or a TIFF? Um, I don't know. I think that their, their SLA says it's the same, but I'm not sure. I, don't quote me on that. But definitely getting it to you and from you, like getting it into the, to the service from, you know, your, we see a lot of people using Snowball, especially for Amazon, because with large AV files, especially when you have a lot of them, it's just a lot of data to push around that doesn't travel well over the pipes. So... Yeah, I don't know. So, so the vendors don't charge per, for time that it takes, though. They only charge for the size of the file. It's just more your own inconvenience for trying to get something faster. Is that right? I Don't quote me. I don't know for sure okay. <laughs> about all of these. And some of them do not have retrieval costs and, it, you know, kind of the get and post costs. They don't, they don't even charge for that. So it, it varies. Um, Per, per provider, um, I don't know for sure if, but I think that it largely is about size, not time. This is Heather. I'd, I'd say that that's at least in the case of of AWS services that that you're you're right on. It's about the the size, not the time. Glacier, I believe, um, says that files if you if you don't use the expedited move, it can take up to twelve hours. I don't think they Give, I mean, I think they give you a rough time frame. Um, I would imagine a larger file would take longer than a smaller one, uh, but I don't think they make any guarantees about speed. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions? Okay, well, thank you both very much for speaking to us today. Um, we really, really appreciate it. And, yes, I, thank you. and I guess, uh, Corey, we will throw the rest of the meeting over to you. Great, thanks so much, uh, Karen and Nicole for facilitating and getting everything organized for today. And 
to Karen and Heather for your insight. Really appreciate all of your time. Uh, we have two more agenda items uh, to talk about today in the 15 minutes that are left to us. Um, the first one being uh, an idea that Nathan shared with me via email around um, perhaps establishing a new member uh, liaison position. And um, apparently there is uh, this type of position uh, for the content interest group. Uh, and Paige Walker, I believe, is in that um, position for the content interest group. I'm wondering if Paige is on the call or if someone, uh, if not Paige, if someone from the content interest group that might be familiar with the, um, uh, with the position. Is there anyone on the call that might have some insight? Okay, so um, I, I think the idea here is is really um, quite basic. It's um, um, sort of a liaison person within the um, infrastructure interest group that would uh, help um, new members get uh, their bearings when they sign up and uh, basically just give them a warm welcome and I think probably also promote the group uh, and some other, uh, you know, basic tasks like that. So I think what uh, Nathan and I can probably do is just circulate a, a really basic uh, uh, description via email, and then we can um, figure out the best way that we could take uh, people that might want to uh, be involved as part of that position. Does that sound like a plan? Are there any other thoughts around that? You can use the chat or unmute your microphone. I think it's a pretty, pretty good idea. Basic and should should help. Okay, great. Well, um, yeah, look for an email from us uh, around that, and I'd really encourage uh, you to think about uh, potentially putting your name forward to do, to do that work. Uh, there are actually quite a few. Um, new NDSA uh, member institutions signing up on a fairly regular basis, so it's really great to give people a warm welcome to the organization. Okay, so next up is the 2019 planning. I believe this conversation has been deferred a number of times, but we have um, 11 sessions uh, next year. Um, actually, 11 um, sort of time slots. I think the thinking right now is that we sort of do, we do two sessions very similar to what we had today, where we pick a topic, we have some facilitators and those facilitators organize speakers and um, and and then so we, we would do that for this was discussed at the uh, the working lunch at Digit Press in Las Vegas. We do that for two sessions and then we have another session that is, uh, you know, basically we have the business agenda of the group, but also it's an open call for people to share information and also uh, get feedback or help with any um, specific things that are happening within their organization that they need the support of this kind of peer network. Uh, to help them with. So in actual fact, I think we would have one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, more like eight sessions, and then the working lunch at DigiPrez in terms of sessions that need um, topics and facilitators. So if you click, if you're in the uh, meeting notes right now or in the agenda, you can click over to the um, proposed topics there. And uh, what we could potentially, let's see, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So we have, uh, we have lots of topics there. You can see some of them need a little bit of refining. <laughs> you have the cloud, double dash the cloud. So, you know, obviously a session talking about uh, something around there. So the facilitator would, would um, or facilitators would be uh, in the position there to help refine um, each of those topics, but um, I'm not exactly sure how this was done last year, but I'm wondering uh, if folks could take a look at the list there uh, and sign up potentially as facilitators. And the responsibility there is basically uh, to uh, work with, uh, identify and work with potential speakers that would talk about a specific thing. It could be one person, it could be uh, a sort of a virtual panel. It's really up to you um, what you'd like to make that session to sort of help the, the community engage with the topic in particular. So um, I'm not really sure. You know, I think what we could probably do is just send up another 
send out another follow-up email. Uh, are there folks on the call right now that uh, are willing to put their names forward as potential facilitators? I know that everyone is probably, first of all, it's just a terrible thing to do to <laughs> call people out, but also a week and a half before Christmas when everyone's probably feeling fairly, uh, or at least before the winter break where everyone is probably feeling like um, uh, like settling down or slightly overwhelmed, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, don't feel obliged to uh, necessarily indicate uh, right now, but um, uh, yeah, just speak up at any point or, or put your name in the chat there. Otherwise, uh, what we can do is uh, send an a email out what we'll do. Maybe Nathan and I can take a first pass at some of the proposed topics to tidy those up a little bit. Um, maybe add the months. Uh, Nathan and I could probably act as facilitators for a few. And I know that um, a number of individuals in previous minutes uh, have indicated their willingness to participate as facilitators. So we can, uh, there's uh, Linda Taddock and um, Sarah uh, Dorpinghaus uh, uh, as possible uh, fac facilitators as well. So what we can do is we'll just send a, another email out and, and tidy up the, uh, the chart a bit and get people a little bit further along. And hopefully there'll be some folks that are willing to uh, facilitate the discussions for next year. Does that sound like a good path forward to anyone or to everyone? Hey, Corey. Uh, Corey, I have a, this is Carol, I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, I'm not volunteering, <laughs> but <laughs> um, the requirements for a robust digital preservation management system, does that sound similar to what they were talking about in the CC meeting? I was actually just about to ask the same thing, Carol. It sounds like what Robin was talking about. Yeah. So that might tie in with the work with that, whatever happens. Okay. Yeah, could you make a note of that in the, um, yeah. yeah, that'd be wonderful, thank yep. you. Hey, Nicole, this is uh, I, could, I could corral, if you want, um, like around March timeframe, I could corral probably two or three people to do a, a, a PASIG overview of what trends they saw coming out of PASIG, Mexico City. So um, keep that okay. as a, in mind if you want it. Okay, I'm just gonna insert a row there. Thanks Art, that's great. Um, Yeah, that's in happening in February, so sometime after that. Hey, any other? Okay. Uh, okay, great. Yeah, so I'll follow up uh, via email. Uh, thanks to those who have expressed their willingness to facilitate previously and Art for speaking up today. Uh, encourage people to put their names forward. And I believe just looking at the chat here, um, Sybil uh, would like to make an announcement before we adjourn. Yes, I just wanted to highlight an email that went out at the end of last week um, about the a call for uh, volunteers for the 2019 Digital Preservation Conference that will be in Tampa. If you're interested in participating, um, there is a link that went out in that email for a form to fill out. Um, if you misplaced the email or did not receive it, feel free to contact me and I will send you the link. That's great. What I can do as well. Um, yeah, so if you want to share that link, uh, if you want to pass it my way or Nathan's way, we can uh, share it to the list as well. Awesome. Yeah, I can put it in the notes too. Perfect. That's great. Okay. Um, Okay, hey, great. Uh, there'll be some action items there, but uh, any other um, any other business or um, news or information folks would like to share? Yeah, Art, um, Passig, would you like to take a moment to get the word out about that? 
Thanks, Court. Yeah, um, attendance is, is slow so far. I'm expecting about right now about 80 people. Uh, but uh, the uh, Latin American contingent will probably come in when their new budgets come in after the first. Uh, so I think we'll probably have, uh, you know, the, the standard 120 or 140 people at pacing. Looks like a good conference. Uh, uh, we, uh, we have Ex Libris, Preservica, and Libnova sponsoring. But I think the topics are there and there's still a lot of openings for um, five minute uh, um, lightning talks. So we're gonna keep it very, as, as usual, very collegial and as much new information as we can. And if, if some of you haven't been there, don't worry about it. We usually get all 60% new attendees. But uh, yeah, I am trying to drum up uh, attendance prior to everybody going away for Christmas. So uh, yeah, that's about it. Uh, it. It looks like a good conference, but I think it'll be, you know, the the area of 120, 130 people. Oh, that's great to hear. If nobody's on, if you're not on the announce PaySig announce uh, mail list and you want to be, just email me. Thanks, Corey. Yeah, thank you, Art. Anyone else who have uh, just a few minutes left here? Okay, well, really appreciate everyone jumping on the call today, especially to our facilitators and speakers. Thanks once again. And uh, I imagine most of you will be um, looking forward to your break coming up here relatively soon. So uh, for those of you traveling, safe travels, we look forward to reconvening in the new year. Thanks, everybody.